Last class we were discussing about sedimentation. We have seen what are the different types of sedimentation and what are the different configuration of sedimentation tanks available and how the efficiency of a sedimentation tank depends upon and if you want to improve the efficiency what are the alternatives we can provide. So today we will discuss about the other treatment process yeah, followed, followed by sedimentation that is coagulation. Coagulation is required when the particles are small because sedimentation we have seen that it is a unit operation that means we are not adding any chemicals or any other external force. The particles are settled because of the gravity force or because of the settling velocity. So this settling velocity is important or the settling velocity is depending upon the size of the particle. If the size of the particle is large enough then we will have a good settling velocity so that the particle will be settling within a given time. But if the particles are too small, then what will happen? The settling velocity will be so small, the time required for the particle to settle will be almost infinity. So at this condition or if the particles are very small and the settling velocities are small, then how can we remove them from the water? For that one, we usually adopt this co coagulation and flocculation. Because if you talk about the size of the particle present in water, it varies 6 order of magnitude. That means starting from pebbles to very, very small colloidal particles. So if the particles are of colloidal nature, then sedimentation is not effective because colloidal particles as such is very, very stable or the suspension of colloidal matter is stable. So the settling is impossible. So if you want to remove them by settling, so we, what we have to do, we have to destabilize them or without destabilization if you can agglomerate them, then what will happen? The size of the particle will be increasing. As the size of the particle increase, the settling velocity also will be increasing because settling velocity is proportional to the square of the diameter. So if we talk about plane sedimentation, it is effective only if the particle size is above 50 micrometer. This I am talking about the particles whatever we are come, we are finding in water. That means sand, clay, silt, etc. which is having a good specific gravity. If the specific gravity of the matter is less, then again the settling velocity will be decreasing. Then we have to have very large particle size to settle them effectively. So this table gives us a clear picture about how the settling velocity of the particle varies with respect to time. As I have already mentioned, the size of the particles, whatever is present in water varies 6 order of magnitude. So starting from pebble, we can see the average size of a particle will be around 10 millimeter. So if the diameter is 10 and we are taking the specific gravity as 2.65, then you will be getting a settling velocity of 0.73 meter per second. It is a very, very high settling velocity. So we can, we can remove the particle very easily. So or by giving very less detention time, the particle will be getting removed from the system. Now we will come to the next size of particle that means coarse sand. The size of this particle, average size we can take it as 1 millimeter. So the settling velocity will be around 0.23 meters per second. Here also the settling or removal by sedimentation is very, very easy because in sedimentation tank we have seen usually we give detention time as or detention time in the order of 3 to 4 hours. So this requires 
very less time. So, 100 percent removal of these things can take place in sedimentation time. Now, we will talk about fine sand. The particle diameter is 0.1 millimeter and the settling velocity is coming down to 0.6 meter per minute and if you talk about silt, the settling velocity is 5.6 meters per day. And if you talk about large colloidal particle, the settling velocity is C 0.3 meters per year. So, so if you go for colloidal particle and we are going to use only plain sedimentation, it takes years to clear the water and once we come to small colloids, that means the particle size is in the order of 0 0.00001, that means 10 raised to minus 6. The settling velocity is 3 meters per million years. That is why most of the colloidal solutions, if you just put it, for example, if you take the milk, milk is an example of a colloidal solution. Whatever the time we keep it, it is not going to clarify by itself unless there is some bacterial action and some other byproducts coming into picture. So, if you want to clear such type of a water, what we can do? We have to make the particle unstable and make them agglomerate together so that the settling velocity will be increasing considerably of this order, then only we can go for sedimentation. So, how can we do this one? Before that one, we will talk about the colloidal stability, why the colloids are so stable compared to other suspension. The colloids are stable because of its large surface area to volume ratio, because, because of that one what will happen? They will be undergoing the Brownian motion and all the co colloids will be in motion and surface phenomena predominates over mass phenomena. So, because of that one what will happen? The settling velocity because of the four weight of the particle will become negligible and moreover the colloidal particles accumulate some electrical charge on the surface of the particle. So, if the particles are charged what will happen? So, many colloidal particles are there in the suspension and each one is having the same charge. So, when two particles of same charge come together or try to come together, what will happen? Because of the charge, they will be getting repelled. And in surface water, most of the time the colloidal particles are basically because of clay and silt. And these particles have a negative charge most of the time. How this charge is coming? It is because of the reorganization of the crystal structure as well as the loosing of atoms because of abrasion and all. What is happening? Which is happening in the suspension or in the solution. So, whatever colloidal particles most of the time whatever we are seeing in water will be having a negative charge. So, all these particles are negatively charged when they come in contact it is not possible them to agglomerate because of the negative charge. So, for example, this is a colloidal particle, a clay particle. So, we have already seen that most of the colloidal particles, whatever is present in water are having negative charges. So, this is having a negative charge. So, what will happen? Because of the negative charge and in the solution there will be so many other ions present because in water we take it, there are for example, calcium, magnesium, sodium, sulphate, chloride, etc. Both cations and anions will be present in the water. So, what will happen to this colloidal particle? And the water as a whole if you take, it will be electrically neutral. So, this particle cannot stay as such. So, what will happen? Since it is having a negative charge, most of the positive charged ions, whatever is present in the water will be coming very close to this one. And as I have already mentioned, water is electrically neutral. So, this positive ions cannot stay like that. So, the counter, counter ions, that means negative ions also coming into picture. So, as the distance from the particle increases, the concentration of the positive ions and negative ions will be decreasing, but we will be having a diffused ion layer like this. So, each colloidal particle will be having a diffuse ion layer like this. Because of that one, what will happen? Colloidal particles will not be able to come closer and unless they come closer, they will not be able to agglomerate. And 
when we talk about colloidal particles, this is the repulsive force or the theta potential. There is an attractive force, whatever we know, because wherever there are two particles, there is a weak attractive forces force acting between them that is known as the Van der Waals force. And, and what will happen to this Van der Waals force? Van der Waals force is proportional to the distance that means it is it is inversely proportional to the distance not not class 1 power it is proportional to 1 by d raised to 6 that means as the distance decreases the Van der Waals force will be increasing in the order of 6 magnitude. So, if you want to bring the colloidal particles together what we have to do we have to first overcome this energy barrier. Energy barrier means the repulsive force whatever is there. So, the attractive force should overcome the repulsive force. So, how can be it possible? So, this we have seen the theta potential which is the repulsive force and this is the Van der Waals force and that is the attractive force. So, the particle will be able to come together only when this theta potential or the repuls repulsive force minus Van der Waals force become positive or if you draw the net force here we can see this is the net force. So, here we can see that the Van der Waals force is higher than the theta potential. So, at that time only the particle will be able to come together. So, up to this point okay, unless we bring the colloidal particles together up to this point it is not able to agglomerate them. So, how can we bring them together? Okay, that is what I was already mentioning agglomeration occurs only after overcoming the energy barrier mechanisms. So, how can we bring them? Because if you give some disturbance in the system, so what will happen? The ions whatever is getting attached to the colloidal particle or the ionic layer, the diffused ionic layer will be shearing off from the particle. So, the particle will be able to come more and more closer. So, the Van der Waals force will be predominating and the particle will be agglomerating. So, how can we achieve this one? Either by Brownian movement or by mechanical agitation. Brownian movement, the transport due to the Brownian movement is known as perikinetic flocculation and by mechanical agitation it is known as orthokinetic flocculation. So, now we will see what is the coagulation theory. So, this we have seen this is your colloidal particle and this represent the number of ions with respect to distance. So, this we are calling as diffuse layer it will be having equal number of counter ions and co ions that means it is having same number of positive ions and negative ions and as we move towards the bulk solution away from the colloidal particle the concentration will be decreasing and finally, there will not be any arrangement of this counter ions and core ions along with the colloidal particle. And this is the figure which represent both the theta potential and Van der Waals force. This is the Van der Waals force. So, Van der Waals force is very very negligible when the distance from the colloidal particle is large. And this is the diffuse layer. So, if the if other colloidal particle comes up to here this point then this diffuse layer and other particles diffuse layer will be interacting. So, they will be repelling each other. So, this shows the net force okay here the net force is somewhere here okay because if you take the difference between the theta potential and Van der Waals force. So, unless this Van der Waals force or the net potential become positive the colloids cannot come together. So, what how can we do this one? How can we reduce the repulsive force and make the colloidal particles come together? So, for that what we do? We usually add chemicals in water treatment process. So, what are the most commonly used chemicals as coagulants used in water treatment are alum which is nothing but aluminum sulphate Al2 SO4 thrice. And trivalent metal ions and we also use ferric chloride, ferrous sulphate etcetera 
and even some natural coagulants we use to achieve this agglomeration. So, what all are the mechanisms involved or how these chemicals are acting on the colloidal particles and make them destabilize and agglomerate. The co colloid coagulation mechanism can be divided into four categories. So, they are first one is ionic layer compression, second one is adsorption and charge neutralization, third one is entrapment in the flocculent mass and adsorption and in the particle bridging. So, we will discuss one by one in detail. So, what is this ionic layer compression? We have already seen how the diffuse layer of ions present in the associated with a colloidal particle. So, and if two colloidal particles are coming together because of the diffuse layer, they will not be able to come closer. So, if we can decrease that diffuse layer distance, so the particle can come more and more closer. So, in this ionic layer compression what the chemical does is, it will be compressing the ionic layer. So, how can you compress the ionic layer? The ion surrounding a particle is a function of electrostatic potential. So, if you give high ionic strength, ionic concentration in the liquid, so what will happen? The ions concentrations are very, very high. So, more and more ions will be going closer to the colloids and the charge effect will be decreasing drastically. So, the diffuse layer length will be reducing. So, if the layer is sufficiently compressed, then what will happen? Van der Waals force predominates and particle get attracted. So, that is what is happening in ionic layer compression. To give an example, if you take, this is an example for ionic layer compression, the turbid stream flows into the ocean. So, the river is coming and it is going, flowing through the plain and it is going to the ocean. So, in exterior what is happening? There are so much of colloidal particles or sand and clay particles present in the incoming river and when it enter in the estuary, the salinity of the water will be increasing because in the estuary the river water and sea water will be getting mixed together. So, the ionic strength of that water is very, very high compared to the river water. So, at this time what happens because of the high ionic strength? the ionic layer or the diffuse layer of the colloidal particles will be getting compressed. So, when two colloidal particles come together, this diffuse layer is so thin compared to the earlier, compared to earlier whatever was occurring in the stream. So, what will happen? The Van der Waals force will predominate and the colloidal particles will be coming in contact and they will be agglomerating. So, this is the reason why deltas are formed in estuaries. Till then the colloidal particles are very, very stable in the stream water and once it comes to the exterior because of the ionic strength increase, ionic layer compression is taking place and the solution become unstable and the particles will be settling down. But if you talk about ionic layer compression, it is not having a predominant role in water treatment because the chemical water we are adding as coagulants in water treatment the concentration is very, very less. So, it will not be creating a high ionic strength in the water. So, the ionic layer compression due to the chemical whatever we are adding in the water treatment for the removal of colloidal particle is not very significant. That is what I have given here. In water treatment, ionic layer compression is insignificant, insignificant as the concentration of alum and ferric chloride use will be very less. So, the concentration range we usually use in water treatment is in the range of 5 to 40 milligram per liter for alum and it is all depending upon the colloidal concentration, the alkalinity of the water, etc. That will be discussed later. Now, the second mechanism is adsorption and charge neutralization. So, what is happening here? So, we have already seen that the chemicals whatever we are using as coagulants in water treatment are alum and ferric chloride and sometimes ferric sulphide. So, when we put this chemical to the water, what will happen? So, this is the reaction. Alum Al2 SFO3 will be dissociating into aluminum and sulphate and this aluminum, aluminum will be reacting with water because these metal ions will be forming 
metal this metal ions will be forming complexes with water and this water will be acting as a weak cationic acid and it will be dissociating and we will be getting different compounds like alloys 2 plus alloy AL, AL7, OH17, AL, OH3, etc. So, what will happen? This, these aqua metallic ions are having high affinity to the colloidal particle. So, what will happen? This aqua metallic ions will go and get attached to the colloidal particles, and already the colloidal particle is having a negative charge. Then, the charge of this aqua metallic ions we have seen every, everything is having a positive charge. So, when they go and get attached to the colloidal particle, the charge will get neutralized. So, once the charge get neutralized, what will happen? There will not be any diffuse layer of ions surrounding the colloidal particle. So, because of that one, what will happen? There is no diffuse layer. So, colloidal particles can come together and they can agglomerate and they can settle down or we can remove them easily. But one problem with this adsorption charge neutralization is that the colloidal particles are having a fixed charge or a fixed quantity of charge and this aqua metallic ions are having opposite charge. So, a certain amount of metals, met, aqua metallic ions can go and sit on the colloidal particle. So, the charge will be getting neutralized, but if more and more aqua metallic ions goes and get adsorbed to the colloidal particle, what will happen? The charge of the colloidal particle will be changing from negative to positive. So, if all the colloidal particles are changing from negative to positive, then again the same problem will be there, because similar charged particles will be repelling each other. So, here if the mechanism is adsorption and charge neutralization, then we have to be very, very careful about the dose. The dose should be sufficient just to neutralize or just to destabilize the colloidal particles. If you add little excess of the required, then what will happen? Again, restabilization of the particle will be taking place. So, this is what I was explaining. So, as we add the aqua metallic ions, the aqua metallic ions get at attracted to the colloidal particles and get attached to them and neutralize the surface charge. Once the surface charge is neutralized, the ionic cloud disappears. So, the particles can come together. But overdosing, the charge reversal and restabilization will be taking place. It is not destabilization, it is restabilization. That means, once the initially the solution was stable, then by adding the chemical, we are destabilizing them. And if we add over, the, the dose is over, then what will happen? Again, restabilization or the colloidal suspension will be becoming stable again. So, we have to be very, very careful about this one. And one more thing I want to tell in ionic layer compression, okay, the valency of the ions are also important. So, we have seen that counter ions and co ions are coming. So, if the ions present in the solution are monovalent, then naturally the diffuse layer will be longer compared to divalent or trivalent ions. So, the valency of the ions, whatever is present in the solution, that is also important when we talk about ionic layer compression. The third mechanism is seep coagulation. So, first one is ionic layer compression and that is not applicable in water treatment because the concentration of chemical whatever we are adding is not sufficient to change the ionic strength considerably. And second one is adsorption and charge neutralization. So, this is a common phenomena whatever is taking place in water treatment when we add alum or ferric chloride. But the most important point to be remembered here is the dose whatever we are adding is very, very important because if you overdose the colloidal particles will be again restabilizing from negative charge to positive charge. Again, we have to go for some other mechanism by which we can agglomerate them and remove them from the system. So, the third mechanism is nothing but sweep coagulation. So, here what is happening? So, after the charge neutralization and colloidal particle agglomeration, Okay, it all depends upon how many particles are present in the system. If the suspension is dilute and the number of colloids present in the suspension is less, then what will happen? Okay, the agglomeration chances are very, very less. 
So, in such cases, how can we remove the collateral particle from the system? So, such conditions we are going for sieve coagulation. Here, what will happen? Addition of metal salts like aluminum sulfate, ferric chloride, calcium oxide, or calcium hydroxide at high concentrations causes the precipitation of metal hydroxide because if aluminum sulfate is added to water, aluminum will aluminum sulfate will be dissociating into uh, aluminum as well as sulfate. See, this aluminum will be reacting with water and it will be forming Al2 Al oil thrice or and it will be consuming some alkalinity also during this process. So, if the concentration of the chemical water we are added is sufficient enough for the precipitation, then naturally the aluminum hydroxide precipitation will be taking place and this precipitate, okay, it will be a dense flock that will be settling down because of its weight. So, when it settles down, what will happen? It will be entrapping the colloidal particle whatever is present in the water. That means, the aluminum hydroxide will be acting as a mass the flock will be settling down. So, along with that one it will be entrapping the colloidal particles and removing it from the system. Same thing is true with ferric ion salts, ferric chloride also. So, ferric will be forming ferric hydroxide and it will be removing the particle. But when we talk about water treatment, most of the time we go for aluminum sulphate or alum. The reason is ferric, ferric ions as we know it will be giving some color to the treated water because when it forms the precipitate, okay, when some salt has to be or some compound has to be precipitated, it has to have the concentration more than the KSP value that means solubility product constant. So, up to that level it will not be precipitating. So, whatever be the condition we won't be able to remove ferric or aluminum completely from the system. So, some concentration will be always remaining in the system which is lower than the solubility product constant. So, because of that one the iron is having some color the treated water also will be having the color. So, water treatment we most of the time go for alum. Now, we will see what are the factors affecting the precipitation. The precipitation is affected by concentration of salt because the precipitation takes place something like this. So, we have to aluminum and hydroxide. So, this will be forming aluminum hydroxide. Aluminum plus 3 hydroxide will be forming aluminum hydroxide. So, what will happen? The solubility product constant, it is nothing but Al3 plus into OH raised to 3. Okay. So, this is very, very important. The compound will be remaining in the solution as long as this aluminum and hydroxide concentration product is less than the KSP value. This KSP value is a constant for the metals. So, what will happen? If we are adding very low concentration of the salt, the value will not be higher than the KSP value. So, we will not be getting any precipitation. But if you add more, more chemical, what will happen? Aluminum concentration will be very, very high. So, we can get a value higher than the KSP value. So, naturally the precipitation will be occurring. And another one is hydroxyl ions, where the hydroxyl ions are coming? Mostly it is coming from water and it is all depending upon the alkalinity of the water. So, one of the important thing for increasing the precipitation efficiency is are add more chemicals. And second one is concentration of anions because we have seen that aluminum hydroxide and hydroxyl ions are required, then if other ions are also present, okay, so that can also increase the precipitation potential. Then another important factor is concentration of colloids. Why it is important? Because aluminum and hydroxide is combining together to form aluminum hydroxide. Initially, it will be very, very fine flux, okay. And unless we get a 
large flock it will not be settling down so how can we make it as a large one so this one is helped by the colloidal particles so what the colloidal particles do colloids act as a nucleus so the particles will be getting or the compound water is formed aluminum hydroxide will be getting attached to the colloidal particle and it will be growing in size so naturally the precipitation will be much much faster and another important thing is so because of this reason if we, if the mechanism of coagulation is sieve coagulation then optimum coagulant dose is inversely proportional to the colloidal concentration why because colloidal particles will be acting as a nucleus so the precipitation will be much much faster so if you have very little colloidal particles there will not be any nucleus available so more and more alum, alum is required to form this aluminum hydroxide precipitate or more and more ferric chloride is required to form ferric hydroxide precipitate and which will be coming down as a sieve flock and removing the colloidal particle and the last mechanism is or among the four the last one is adsorption and in the particle bridging so till now we were discussing about alum and ferric chloride which are the most commonly used coagulants in water treatment but we can even use synthetic organic po polymers whether anionic or cationic or neutral polymers for the removal of colloidal particles from water and compared to non ionic or cationic polymers anionic polymers are more effective and it is also found that even natural coagulants are very very effective now one of such is moringa olifera seeds it is nothing but the drumstick whatever we usually use in the kitchen so this drumstick seeds if you make a paste of this drumstick seeds and put it in water we can see that the colloidal particles are getting settled okay so that is a an example of natural polymer moreover this moringa olifera is having one more property which is helpful for water treatment it is having disinfection characteristics so if you use moringa olifera seeds for co coagulation what will happen it will be removing colloidal particles as well as it will be disinfecting the water and another natural natural coagulant we use is nirmali seeds so what i i want to tell is apart from this alum and ferric chloride we can use synthetic organic polymers so when we consider this polymers how they will be looking like this polymers may be linear or branch with highly reactive surfaces so anyway i will be showing the pictures afterwards so what will happen it it is a branch with so, several functional group attached to that one so what will happen the colloids will be coming and getting attached to different branches so as a result what will happen the polymer chain is there and many colloidal particles are getting attached to this one so the weight of that polymer will be increasing and it will be settling down faster so this is a polymer we can see it is a long one with many branches and this is the colloidal particle so what will happen the destabilized particle will no the polymer is having some charge and the particle is going and getting attached to this polymer so what will happen the particle is getting destabilized because the particle will be having one charge and the polymer is having another charge so it will be getting destabilized so when two such particles comes which is already destabilized by the polymers they can combine together and they can form a flock like this this flock is flocculation can occur because of perikinetic motion or orthokinetic flocculation so sometimes what will happen the branch chains are there and this is a destabilized particle and if the polymer is not coming in contact with other other colloids what will happen this one will be again getting attached to the same colloid that means here one charge site is there and this colloid is having another charge or the opposite charge here it is getting destabilized but see this chain is having so many other locations with specific charges so it is searching for other colloidal particles but your suspension is not having 
enough concentration of colloidal particles, then what will happen? This will not be getting other colloidal particle. So, at if you are stirring or there is perikinetic flocculation or orthokinetic flocculation happening in the system, what will happen? Sometimes the polymer chain will be getting attached to the colloidal particle again. That means, more than one functional group or more than one surface charge is getting attached to the colloidal particle. So, colloidal particle will be restabilizing again. So, as such the polymer is not very heavy. So, what will happen? The particle is again restabilized. So, it will not be getting removed from the system. So, this is another thing. If you add excess polymers, so two or three polymer molecules are there and particle is there. So, initially itself the polymers, all the three polymers are getting attached to the same colloidal particle. So, no vacant sites are available for the polymers. So, no more attachment can take place and if you consider the colloidal particle what is happening? More than one site is getting attached. So, the charge is reversed and the colloidal particle will be becoming stable again. So, this is an example of F log. Okay. Here we have seen to one colloidal particle is a getting attached to a polymer and another one is getting attached to another polymer. So, if we give gentle mixing or flocculation, proper flocculation, what will happen? The flock is forming. So, this is a flock thus formed and if you give more and more flocculation or more and more mixing, what will happen? The flock will be getting ruptured like this and again it will be affecting the efficiency of this colloidal particle removal. And this is another example, what is happening is already the flock is formed and it is searching for another and the colloidal particle, but some other polymer branch is coming and getting attached to that, that one. That means this is known as secondary adsorption of polymer. So, again the particle will be getting restabilized. So, we should be very, very careful when we go for this adsorption and entrapment of particles. Okay. So, this is what is more preferable. So, the dose should be sufficient enough for the destabilization of the colloids and the velocity gradient or flocculation whatever we are providing should be sufficient enough to form the flocks and it should not be having high intensity so that the flocks will be shearing off or rupturing. So, this is whatever I have explained, I will once again read, okay. synthetic organic polymers for example, anionic, anionic, cationic or non-ionic polymers can be used for the adsorption for the coagulation, but anionic polymers are more effective compared to others and these polymers may be linear or branched with high reactive surfaces. Several colloids may become attracted to one polymer, then several of the polymer colloidal group may become enmeshed and that will improve the settling. But if the coherent dose is high, then restabilization will be taking place. Low concentration is insufficient for the destabilization. So, here also if you are using polymers also, it is essential to find out the optimum dosage of the coagulant. So, how can we find out the optimum dosage? So, once again I will repeat the four mechanisms are of coagulation are ionic layer compression, adsorption and charge neutralization, sieve coagulation and adsorption and interpractical bridging. So, in each case apart from the first one, first one is not coming in water treatment. So, for all these things optimum coagulant dose is essential, otherwise what will happen? The colloidal particles will be restabilizing and will not be getting sufficient removal. So, how to find out the optimum coagulant dose? Though we know what are the reasons for the coagulation, the coagulation theory is not yet fully developed. So, by theoretical means we are not able to find out what is the coagulant dose required. And one more thing is that the coagulant dose will be varying with respect to the water because it is depending upon the alkalinity of the water, colloidal concentration of the water, etcetera. So, it is essential before designing any coagulation flocculation system to carry out the 
experiment in the lab using the same type of water and same system, same coagulation flocculation system or same design criteria and conduct the jar test to find out the coagulant dose. So, what is this jar test? It is nothing but we are taking the water samples in a series of 6 beakers and we are adding different doses of the coagulant that either alum or ferric chloride and one beaker will be keeping as the blank or it will be acting as a control and add the coagulant dose simultaneously to all the 6 beakers then mix the content rapidly for 1 minute. So, this ensures the chemical is getting mixed properly and uniformly available all throughout the volume of water and afterwards slow mixing, slow mixing is for 15 to 20 minutes then after the slow mixing we are giving a settling time of 30 minutes. So, what is happening here? First we are adding the chemical then we are providing rapid mixing. So, the chemicals are getting mixed well and the ions will be going and either get at attached to the particle that means adsorption and charge neutralization or sieve coagulation or adsorption and inter particle bridging whatever be the mechanism it will be taking place here in the rapid mixing that chemical reaction is taking place and in slow mixing what will happen the particles water is restabilized initially that will be coming closer or we are trying to agglomerate the particle by giving a slow velocity gradient or small velocity gradient. So, the small slow mixing will be ensuring the transport step, step of coagulation and flocculation and chemical addition and rapid mix is ensuring the destabilization step of coagulation and flocculation or in other ways coagulation and flocculation is basically involves two steps one is particle destabilization and second one is transport of the particle. So, destabilization is essential to bring the colloidal particles close by and transport is required to agglomerate them. So, this is what is happening in jar test. So, this is exactly what we do in the field in coagulation flocculation system. So, uh, this shows a jar test apparatus. So, we this is a mixing device and these are the different jars which is having same quantity of water and different doses of alum and this is a speed controller. So, all the particles are moving at the same speed ok. So, we can control the speed. So, rapid mixing will be giving a high speed and slow mixing will be giving a very low RPM. And coagulation mechanism is varying depending upon the turbidity, turbidity of the water. So, the turbidity we can classify into 4 categories S1, S2, S3, S4. So, by considering these 4 different turbid concentrations we can explain the coagulation mechanism very very clearly. So, here the S1 is very low compared to S2 and S4 is very very high concentration. So, we can see four different zones when we go for the coagulation. In zone 1 what is happening? Insufficient colloids are present to form settleable mass and in zone 2 what happens? De destabilization by adsorption and charge neutralization is taking place and zone 3 charge reversal and restabilization takes place and zone 4 sweep coagulation. So, zone 1 will be predominant in S1 ok. I will show you in my pictures. So, these are different colloidal concentration. So, this is for colloidal concentration S1. So, in the first zone what is happening? Zone 1 is nothing but the colloidal concentrations are so less or the particle concentration is less. So, in the particle uh, contact and agglomeration is not possible and so if the colloidal concentration of the water sample is less then what is the mechanism of colloidal particle removal? It is nothing but sieve coagulation that means the coagulant whatever is added it will be forming a precipitate and that precipitate will be coming down as a blanket and it will be enmeshing all the colloidal particles present in the water. So, the mechanism is nothing but 
sieve coagulation. And now coming to the colloidal concentration S2. S2 is slightly higher than S1. So, here what will happen? The colloidal concentrations are sufficiently large. And we are adding coagulant to the system. So, what will happen? The coagulant or this aqua metallic ions will be going and getting attached to the colloidal particle and one they are destabilizing and this destabilized particle will be coming in contact and they will be agglomerating and getting pre precipitated or getting settled down. But if you increase the dose of the coagulant, what will happen? So, this SON3, this is nothing but here something is getting precipitated, but in SON3, okay, that means the coagulant dose is more. So, the whatever is getting attached more and more aqua metallic ions are getting attached to the colloidal particle. So, the charge is reversing. So, the suspension is again becoming stable or this, this sound represents the restabilization sound. So, we will not be able to remove any colloidal particle here and coming to the last stage here the removal is taking place by sieve coagulation. So, this is what is happening. So, if we can adjust the coagulant dose. So, we can remove a certain extent of the colloidal particle if the suspension is coming under S2 that means moderately high concentration. Now, we talk about the colloidal particle or colloidal concentration of S3 that means it is higher than S2 and lower than S4 okay, mo moderately high concentration. So, in SON1 we are not getting anything because initially the dosage is not sufficient to destabilize all the particle. So, the particles, the destabilized particle concentration is lower here. So, what will happen? There will not be enough agglomeration. So, we are not getting any removal of turbidity. So, this axis represents the residual turbidity. So, the turbidity of the system will be remaining as such. But if you increase the coagulant dose, uh, slightly more, then what will happen? All the particles are getting destabilized by adsorption and charge neutralization. This SON represents the adsorption and charge neutralization. So, what will happen? There are considerable amount of colloidal particles present in the system and the particles are destabilized by the coagulant addition. So, this destabilized particle will be agglomerating or because of perikinetic motion or orthokinetic flocculation, these particles will be coming into contact and they will be agglomerating and settling down. So, so you will be getting a residual turbidity almost 0 here. But if you further increase the dosage, what will happen? All the destabilized particle will be adsorbing more and more metal ions and they are again getting restabilized. That means, the charge is getting reversed and the solution will be restabilized. So, again the colloidal particle concentration in the solution will be very very high. So, if you want to remove the colloids further then what we have to do? We have to go for sieve coagulation. Now, we will talk about the last category. Here the colloidal concentration is very very high. So, the amount of alum dose required for charge neutralization or destabilization is very, very high. So, here we can say initially everything is not getting destabilized, but as the coagulant dose increase, the destabilization will be taking place okay, and all the colloidal particles will be getting removed because here the concentration of colloidal particles are so high. So, we do not have to bother about the dosage of coagulant and thinking about whether charge reversal will be taking place or not because the whatever the dose whatever we are commonly used in the treatment system that will not be sufficient to reverse the charge. So, these are the mechanisms of co coagulation and it depends upon the colloidal concentration in the solution. That means, if the concentration of the colloids or the turbidity of the water is not very very high, the mechanism which prevails is sieve coagulation. If the colloidal concentration is moderately high, then we can get some removal because of adsorption and charge neutralization, but major mechanism is sieve coagulation. 
but if the colloidal concentration is considerably high then we can remove everything by adsorption and charge neutralization but we have to be careful very very careful about the dosage of coagulant because if the coagulant dosage is slightly higher all the particles whatever is destabilized and about to remove from the system will be again restabilized or charge reversal will be taking place and it will be it will become a stable solution and it will not be getting removed so how can we remove them only by sieve coagulation and this is the last one that means the concentration of the colloids are so high so here the mechanism is adsorption and charge neutralization and we don't have to bother about the concentration of the coagulant whatever we are adding or dosage of the coagulant because the concentration of the colloidal particles are so high so the reversal may not be taking place because unless we are very very high concentration of coagulant to the system so he, this this is the same concept represented in another way so this one s1 s2 s3 and s4 and this is the dosage of coagulant so if the concentration of coagulant colloid particle present in the system is very low then we have to add very high concentration of coagulant the, because the mechanism is sieve coagulation and if it is moderately high what can we do if we add some extra turbidity to the water then adsorption and charge neutralization will be taking place but that will be happening only for a short range of this dosage because what will happen initially it is not sufficient to destabilize everything here everything is getting destabilized and it is removing but if we slightly increase the dosage again restabilization will be taking place and the removal mechanism is sieve coagulation this is s3 here also initially there will not be any removal here adsorption and charge neutralization is taking place and if the dose is high reversal can occur and again sieve coagulation here it is very very high concentration so initially the dose is not sufficient for the destabilization once it destabilizes agglomeration will take place and it will be getting removed from the system another important point when we talk about coagulation and flocculation is the nature of the water alkalinity plays a very very significant role okay we'll see about this alkalinity and how it is affecting the coagulation process in detail in the next lecture so now we'll try to recollect what what all things we have discussed today because sedimentation is basically a unit operation we are not adding any chemicals or external substances so it is because of the physical force of gravity the particles are getting removed from the system but we know the water will be having various sizes of particles so it is not easy to remove everything by mere gravity force because the size of the particles vary the order of six magnitudes starting from pebble to small colloidal particles so the settling time if you consider it varies from few seconds to millions of years so and we are not able to provide so much of time in a sedimentation time because if you want to provide say one day or two day imagine what is the volume of tank required because if you consider a city we have to supply so much quantity of water and if you want to store them in a tank for one day two day or half an year then imagine the volume of the tank required so the treatment is not economical so how can we improve this process for that one we are going for coagulation and flocculation here what we do the finer particles we are making them to come closer and agglomerate so that the particle size will be increasing and the settling velocity will be increasing considerably so that the time required for removal will be reduced drastically so that is the basic principle of coagulation and flocculation so it involves two steps one is the transport step and the one is the destabilization step in transport step what we are doing is we are trying to bring the colloidal particles together either by perikinetic flocculation or orthokinetic that means mechanical mixing or the thermal mixing whatever is taking place in the liquid and the second one is destabilization how can we destabilize the particle by adding some chemical which can change the nature of the colloidal particles 
why the colloids are stable? This is because of the surface properties of the colloids. Because of that one, it is having a repulsive force because most of the colloids will be having a charge. So, because of the charge, it will be having a repulsive force and there will be an attractive force. Unless the attractive force overcome the repulsive force, we will not be able to make them come closer. So, and how we are doing this in coagulation and flocculation? Basically, coagulation involves four mechanisms. They are ionic layer compression. Here, what we do? The diffused ion layer, whatever is surrounded in the colloid, we are trying to narrow it down. So, what will happen? Two colloidal particles can come together and agglomeration can take place. And second one is adsorption and charge neutralization. Here, what happens? The coagulant those water, coagulants water we are adding to the water, they will be forming aqua metallic ions which is having high affinity to the colloidal particles. So, it is getting attached and utilizing the thing. And third one is forming a precipitate and along with the precipitate remove the thing. And the last one is adsorption and interparticle bridging. So, in all the cases the coagulant dose is very very important and the optimum coagulant dose is a function of the nature of the water as well as the concentration of tablet matter present in the water. And it is always easy to remove a water which is having very high turbidity compared to a water sample which is having low turbidity because high turbidity the major mechanism is adsorption and charge neutralization. Whereas, in low turbidity water the mechanism is sieve coagulation. To form that sieve coagulation we have to add more and more chemicals because the precipitation is basically depending upon the concentration of the chemical we add. So, we will continue in the next class. Thank you.